Hey, it's Danny with Butler Tires and Wheels. When it comes time to upgrade the wheels and tires on your car, truck, or SUV, don't trust just anyone. Trust the experts who know how performance wheels and tires best. Butler Tire. From Jeeps to trucks, Mustangs to Maseratis, Butler stocks the latest and largest inventory of custom wheels and tires built specifically for your vehicle that in most cases can be installed the same day. For superior service and quality products expertly installed, visit one of our four Atlanta locations today. Butler Tire. We baby your car. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that just can't be stopped. When you zig, he zags. He's all shimmy and no shake. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Speed Wobbles from Key Brewing Company, garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. This is the first beer in a series of customized batches. The Bustin' Boards crew and the Key Brewers dropped a gnarly combo of hops to land this very satisfying IPA that you can ride all day. Remember, hoppiness breeds happiness. And today we are getting happy thanks to our good garage friends. First up, Way high up in the 21st Century Tower, we have May listening in Dubai. And a big shout out to Emma in Windsor, Ontario. And a small shout out to Emily in Charleston, West Virginia. And next we have one of our Instagram followers, Jessica in Northern Sweden. And a big shout out to Paula in Reading, Pennsylvania. All right, next up we have Molly in beautiful Austin, Texas. And last but certainly not least, we have two great gents at a Boston Mass. We have Theo and his father, Ted. Big cheers to Theo and Ted. Hopefully they are drinking beers and listening to this episode together. Thank you all for going to truecrimegarage.com and clicking on the donate button and filling up the fridge for this week's show. Yeah, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And if you haven't, take a second and give us a five-star review. And that's enough of the beers. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. After a night of drinks and dancing on August 22, 2009, 29-year-old mother and nurse Tony Sharpless disappears after leaving a party in the early morning hours of August 23rd. Now let's get back to the house where Tony was last seen. The people whom we know to be at the home that night, according to Crystal Johns, who was with her at the party. Police Lieutenant Frank Higgins said that they interviewed all the people at the house that night. And I believe he said that all of them were cooperative as well. So this included Willie Green. Remember, he's the owner of the house. Right. And they all seem to back up Crystal's story that Tony left the home under her own power. The police stated publicly that there was no indication whatsoever of foul play. No one at the party was a suspect and there were no persons of interest that they had uncovered in their investigation. I wonder if they let them search the property. From everything that I have seen, there was never a search of the property or the house. 
Specifically, Lieutenant Higgins said, quote, nothing took place there that would lead us to believe that something happened there, end quote. So we don't know how in-depth any of these, quote-unquote, interviews with the people at the house were. Um, It was Elaine Law, a private investigator on this case, whom we discuss, we'll discuss her more in a bit, She is under the impression that Willie Green basically told the cops that it was mostly just his family there that night and that they didn't really know anything. And she says they weren't really questioned in this case. To be Mm -hmm. clear, as we pointed out just a minute ago, Willie Green's home was not subject to any kind of search. And none of the people at his house that night, aside from Crystal, have spoken about the events of that evening publicly. Which is, I find, ridiculous because this is her last known whereabout. So search the property. Yeah, so for many people interested in this case, the quick dismissal of the party goers as potentially involved parties does not sit well. And the failure to investigate a possible crime scene is, I think, inexcusable. Willie Green, we are told, as you said, he fully cooperated. It does seem that the fact that a woman went missing after being at his home in a compromised state should warrant further investigation. Well, and there was a conflict as well. Right. I always wondered if that conflict had truth or merit to it or if it was something that that everybody was making up to cover up something else. Yeah, so Tony's friend Gigi Hayes, right? She's the one who organized the Texas EquiSearch Search of the River. Yeah. She regularly contacted the police demanding that Willie Green and all the others be formally questioned. She is under the impression that Matt Green, somebody else who was at the party, and the uncle of Willie and Matt Green both have criminal histories. And she says these two should have been looked into very closely. Repeated attempts by private investigator Elaine Law to contact Willie Green have been completely disregarded. She did not even get a return call from his attorney. If he is at all concerned about the fact that a woman disappeared from his home, he certainly is not showing it. So now let's ask the question, Captain, is Crystal telling the truth? She's the only one that we've heard speak publicly about what happened that night. Well, I I think like you said earlier, she's been pretty cooperative and she's also been very eager to talk and to get the story out there. And as the years go by, she's kind of now more reluctant to, to talk about the case. Um, is that fair to say? Oh, agreed. 100%. And, and here's, here's the problem with crystal. It's hard for me to really get a, a, a fix on her. Mm-hmm. I, I can't, I can't figure her out because we have the situation, as you said, where early on in this case, I mean, we're coming up on 10 years now. Mm-hmm. She was at one point talking and very active and vocal about what happened that night and about her missing friend. And yes, that has tapered off over the years. Some of that might not be because she is hiding anything or because she isn't telling the truth. She has taken a lot of flack on the internet. A lot of people have gone after her. Yeah. And it could just be for that. I mean, at some point when you're trying to help a situation, you know, you and I jokingly say it sometimes, um, no good deed goes unpunished. If she, in fact, is out there trying to help find her friend and she's getting shit on for it, Mm. one can only take that. One can only take that for so long. You can only take so much shit. And here's the other thing that makes it hard for me to get a real good handle on her is Mm. that in the beginning, not only is she talking, but she seems to be doing things that are helpful to the search for Tony Sharpless. Yeah. She is one that is reported to have called and report Tony is missing. She is one that is reported to have 
helped the family print flyers and distribute flyers looking for Tony. Right, and this is also, you're with your friend. She might not even have known that Tony was going through these battles with her mental illness, switching of medications. Uh, she might not have known any of that. Well, according and, to Crystal, she said she did not know any of that. Right. She didn't know that Tony was not supposed to be drinking. And Crystal almost gives the suggestion that had she known, had she been aware of what was going on in Tony's life, mm-hmm. that she likely wouldn't have asked her to go out dancing and drinking and partying with her that yeah, day. Yeah, she probably wouldn't have asked that. And then when you go back to this party and there's a confrontation, that's probably seems a little strange. Uh, but again, she's probably just going, okay, well, we had a couple drinks. But you would have uh, way more knowledge about the situation. Then you get into the car with her and you get in an argument and she tells you to leave. One, you're probably not going to be letting her drive. Two, you're not getting out of that car. And l- let's be clear, if you're drunk at a party or not drunk, let's say you're tipsy at a party and you guys decide to leave, but you're 40 minutes away from where you know your safe area and your friend drops you off and they don't come back to get you, you're going to be pissed. And you have every right to be pissed. And and she she hasn't been and she's been championed to go, hey, we want to figure out what happened to my friend. And she probably feels a little bit responsible because she didn't know about these things. Like you said, she invited her out, probably wanted of, uh, n- probably would have invited to hang out with her, but wouldn't have went to a party, went to a club. So she's been a champion to keep the story in, in the limelight. But you see this with like when Brian Schaefer went missing, last person, one of the last people to be with him is Clint. He gets thrown under the bus and the Tyler Davis case, you know, his wife and his friend are now being thrown under the bus. So you just become that part of the story. So Crystal's being thrown under the bus. And again, how much shit can you take? Well, and then you have the flip side of that same coin. And on the flip side of that coin, what do we see? We see people that say Crystal went out of her way to make sure that she was one of the people that reported Tony missing, that she helped create this story and helped to give credence to that story by making two phone calls to Tony's phone. So you're saying that people are saying that she's creating the narrative. Correct. And Tony's Mm -hmm. friends, Mm -hmm. Tony's longtime friends, Mm-hmm. They say they believe Crystal is lying and they believe it's very strange that the police have put all of their trust into Crystal's story about what happened. Right. But one of the reasons why they put their trust into her story is because she did something that we never advise and that is to ask for a polygraph. So she takes a polygraph, which I don't think any lawyer would tell you to do. But I think she was pretty adamant on trying to clear her name. Yes, I I have that she offered to take a polygraph, did so, and passed the polygraph test, the polygraph examination. The The other thing, too, is uh, there are questions about what her relationship is with Matt Green. And there's still questions about what exactly went down at the party even if you believe Crystal or not. That's just my opinion. She was the first to call police when Tony failed to show up the next day. As I pointed out, she did help in the searches for Tony, putting up the flyers. She did talk to media. I have a question for you. I don't know if you can answer this because I couldn't figure it out. Are the initial reports, when when they're talking about the the events of that night are the initial reports. Are they talking about the conflict that happened at, at the house and why they left the house? Because mm-hmm. it, it doesn't seem that clear. And I always wondered what, you know, which came first, you know, um, do the, did they not talk about why they left? And then once crystal figures out that her friend was dealing with some mental issues, is that when the story of the conflict came out? Because I just think that would be kind of telling. No, the story of of the conflict at the house came out once it was known that that Tony was missing. Right, so it came out right away. 
It came out fairly early, yes. Okay. Yes, not to the general public, but to the Law people enforcement. to people searching for yeah. Tony. But, you know, here's the thing. While Crystal has put up publicly, anyway, put up a good front as being a concerned friend, and maybe she is legitimately a concerned friend. As you pointed out, she did pass that polygraph. And she has generally stuck to her story. Again, it's the it goes back to social media and things that I've seen on the internet. She clearly has not come out smelling like a rose during this whole thing. Elaine Law, the private investigator who is searching for Tony, she says she interviewed Crystal for four hours. And her statement is is this. She feels that while Crystal was not straight up lying about the situation, mm -hmm. she says that she believes that she is not being fully truthful either. And Interesting, she, because you could take a polygraph test and and tell the truth, but but be omitting things. So the right, and the thing here is that the private investigator basically believes that Crystal knows more than what she is saying to law enforcement and to the public. And she cites that she really does not like the fact that Crystal refused to show her her phone records from that time period. Yeah. That's the private shady. investigator is looking for confirmation of those. Sh the two calls. Correct. She wants to line those up with what she knows about Tony's phone. Well, and I, and I would also want to know who she called after that because she, she claimed that she, she calls Tony's phone twice doesn't get a reply, then she is calling multiple people to get a ride. I want to know who she's calling after that. Did she call Matt Green? Um, I'd be interested in that. But also, maybe those two calls never happen. But wouldn't they be able to get Tony's cell phone records at some point? Oh, they do have them. The okay. private investigator has them. And so that's where I question, are they only simply coming up as incoming calls? Right. I doubt that. I'm guessing that part of the reason why maybe police are really going on Crystal's story is two reasons. One, the other people at the party that night, according to... Here's the other thing. We don't really fully know a full list of the people at the party. Right. All we have is the people that, that law enforcement spoke to saying, yeah, uh, what, this is it. This is all the people that were there that night. And then on top of that, they they may have Tony's records saying that it was in fact, crystal that called her on those two times, six minutes apart around the time that she vanished. And so that kind of backs up Crystal's story as well. I think what Elaine law is saying here is exactly what you just said. She wants to know what other activity was going on with crystal's phone before those calls between those calls and afterwards, who is she talking to? And, Mm. One thing that would would cause a big shakeup and a big wrinkle in her story would be if, in fact, she did phone anybody that was still at that party at that time or, or believed to be at Willie Green's house at that time, because that doesn't seem to gel with with her actions of what she said to the public, you know, that I called I called my friends, my family looking for a ride home because I was dumped on the side of the road. Well, again, it's strange, though, too, because we have the last person supposedly with her. You, you wonder how much she was questioned when they when people are people are questioning how much people were questioned at the party. How much was Crystal questioned? And she was the one that came forward and said, well, I'll take a polygraph test. They didn't even ask her to. She was the one willing to. So then you wonder if they even how much they've checked her phone records. Or did they just go, well, we, we talked to the cousin, so we know that the cousin came and picked her up. So, so I know that we're kind of spinning our tires on this here a bit, but before we'll we do move whatever on, we want. I want to make sure that everyone has their seats in the full upright position because this is where the story starts to get weird, okay? On September 14th, this is about three weeks after Tony disappeared. Authorities in Pennsylvania got word that the New Jersey State Police had a possible hit on Tony's car. On September 8th, a stationary New Jersey State Police vehicle parked in Camden had seen something. An automated license plate reader mounted in the police car recorded the plate number on each car, P. 
passing it. A car bearing plate number DND7772 passed and was recorded. The automated plate reader ran the plate, and because Tony's car was listed as missing, remember they Mm. reported it as missing, Mm. it would have notified the officer manning the vehicle that it was possibly her car. But the police car was parked and no one was in it, so no one noticed the license plate number hit until a week later. Right. Now, it's worth noting that I have read that these license plate readers are not 100%, 100% of the time. I've seen some people point out things that they're more likely closer to 90% accurate. The other thing that we got to keep in mind too is it's possible that it was not Tony's car that was seen, but simply a car with the license plate number DND7772. Right was in Camden on September 8th. The, the plate was on a different vehicle. Now, private investigator... Well, well, you have that idea, but you also have the other idea that you can have the same license plate number, but a different state. Hmm. So, so Elaine Law, who is working on this case, but private investigator, yeah, and who I spoke with briefly for this episode, she, she actually is the one that told me to cover this case. I approached her about a different case that she was working. Mm. There, there's a case out there and I, I won't go into specific specifics about it because the family asked that we not cover it. Mm-hmm. The victim's family. It was a case that I had wanted to cover for some time. There's very little information out there in the newspapers and in the public about it. And I saw Elaine law's name in one of the newspaper articles So I contacted her thinking, well, if we're going to learn anything about that case, we need to get it from her to which she says, look, the family doesn't really want it to be covered. Um, Why don't you take a look at, and she tossed out a few other cases that she had been working on that really need the public's help and, and really need a, a voice thrown out there and the story told one more time in hopes that it hits the right ears. So she told us that a Camden police officer, this is a little, this is a little off the record here Mm. that a Camden police officer told her that a car with Tony's plate number also got a parking ticket in the city around that same time period. But he didn't go into further detail about that whole situation. I could not find that anywhere. So it seems like at least that plate number has popped up twice on Camden police radar. So the New Jersey state police says both that they and the Camden police scoured the area, but never found any other trace of the car with that plate on it. Now, Lieutenant Higgins of lower Marion township police department says, quote, cars don't usually disappear entirely. At some point in the future, they turn up whether it's a junkyard or somewhere else. End quote. But we know Tony's car has never turned up. And the idea that her car may have been in Camden in an area riddled with drugs, prostitution, and crime has led to a predominant theory of what possibly could have happened to Tony. Now, we also have private investigator Elaine Law. She talked about tips that came in and also about possible sightings of Tony. So about a month after, well, six weeks, a month and a half after Tony vanished, yeah, a former detective, uh, private investigator, Elaine Law, offered her services to the family for $1. She saw Tony's case on the news and felt that it was something that there was possibility based on the amount of sex trafficking in the area and tips about possible sightings of Tony that Tony was still alive and possibly either involved in drugs and prostitution, or she had been trafficked. So Elaine started a website to gather tips. She met with both Crystal and the family, tried to contact Willie Green, held a town meeting about the case. She kept Tony's picture in the media, even going around Camden with a picture of Tony asking pimps, dealers, 
working girls and residents if they had seen her. Right, because you have an individual that, again, is struggling with mental illness, shouldn't be drinking, but was drinking, uh, has had some struggles with addiction in the past. Is it possible that this uh, she gets in this conflict that kind of pushes her over the edge, and when she leaves her friend, uh, she doesn't really know where she's at, but then she goes, hey, you know, uh, maybe I can get some drugs by going to Camden. And if, and if you go there, then who knows what bad things could happen. Elaine says that she has gathered 50-plus tips that track Tony from initial sightings near or in Lancaster, where she worked, to Camden, and then to Philly, saying it's almost as if Tony was being moved around. Some of these tips place Tony in the presence of a large black man and a skinny Hispanic man with a goatee. And there was a sighting of a woman having very dark under eye circles, almost raccoon eyes, something that apparently Tony struggled with since her teen years. And then one guy said he had seen Tony four times in Camden and that they had the same heroin dealer. Another tip came from a security guard that placed an abandoned, dirty, scraped up black sedan with tinted windows so a vehicle matching a similar description to Tony's, under the Ben Franklin Bridge between Philly and Camden shortly after she went missing. It had no plates. And the Camden police never disclosed whether they followed up on that vehicle sighting or the sightings of possibly Tony. Now, of course, we also have no idea whether any of these tips are correct and if Tony was actually seen. And many of these tips do come from people that I would consider to be less than reliable. And if it was Tony that was seen, then you have other things to wonder about. Was she abducted or did she go willingly? Yeah, it's and it's very hard to... I feel for this whole situation because of her struggles with the mental illness. If she hits a point of a uh, manic state and then she's using drugs. The drugs could can, you know, have her continue to stay in a manic state and, it, and, and who knows where she's at. So one thing I do know though, too, is that police, they say that they looked into whether Tony ever purchased drugs in Camden. They came up with nothing regarding that. And they also said that there is actually no evidence at all that she even knew anyone in that area. The other thing, too, if it was drugs that she went after that night or or if that's the reason that kept her away, it seems a little strange to me. It seems like there would have been a lot of other places closer to home to make that score. The case did start to grow cold. After these tips were coming in, these were pretty early in the investigation, pretty early in Elaine Law's investigation. I do want to get to some other interesting tips in this case, okay? A call that was made to West Brandywine Township Police Department. This is a call where a man claimed to be from the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. This is an agency similar to the CIA in Toronto. The man said agents found a car parked on their lot and traced the car to Tony. And the agents also found someone who they believed to be Tony, matching her description. The man provided an email address and a phone number where he could be reached and requested photos of Tony. The address and phone number, however, turned out to be a fake. Chief Warner said police called the Toronto Police Department and was told the call must have been faked. Chief Warner said that the caller was, quote, the guy had all the right answers. He was talking the police lingo and he knew what to say, end quote. Several days later, an officer in West Brandywine Police Department's radio room took a call from a sheriff's deputy in South Dakota. The deputy claimed that officers found Tony's car there. The man promised to fax information over, but never did. Officers contacted the man's alleged department, 
but personnel there had no knowledge of the vehicle or of the man who made the call. We have Chief Warner again who says, look, we got a copy of that recording. And he says it was the exact same guy that he talked to, the the guy that claimed to be from Toronto. He said that the reason why he could identify the caller as being the same is he described this man as having an interesting voice. It was something about the way that this man sounded that Chief Werner was able to believe that the caller was, in fact, the same. The thing, though, that's weird here and just kind of really blows my mind is why would somebody bother to stage these two hoaxes? This is four years after Tony went missing. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, hel dot garage. Hey, it's Danny with Butler Tires and Wheels. When it comes time to upgrade the wheels and tires on your car, truck, or SUV, don't trust just anyone. Trust the experts who know how performance wheels and tires best. Butler Tire. From Jeeps to trucks, Mustangs to Maseratis, Butler stocks the latest and largest inventory of custom wheels and tires built specifically for your vehicle that in most cases can be installed the same day. For superior service and quality products expertly installed, visit one of our four Atlanta locations today. Butler Tire. We baby your car. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access, forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. All right, we're back, you filthy animals. Stay filthy, you animals. Stay filthy. Well, you know, we were talking about this on Saturday at, at our um, presentation, meetup, whatever you want to call it. It's, um, being a true crime lover is becoming a little more acceptable in society. So we're, we're becoming less filthy animals of the true crime kingdom. It ain't easy being greasy. Yes. <laughs> or cheesy. Uh, in late 2013, something happened that could give us a significant clue into Tony's disappearance. Private investigator Elaine Law received a letter at her office. The one-paged, unsigned letter postmarked in Trenton, New Jersey on November 29th arrived in her mail December 1st. She didn't initially notice the letter in the pile of mail, and she was shocked when she observed the return address. It was from Tony Sharpless. Now, Tony is typically spelled T O N I. Mm -hmm. On the return address, it was T O N Y Sharpless. Now, here is the text of the letter Dear Elaine Law, the police and PA do not have a tip line. I tried calling the Philly police where I live, but they said it was not in their jurisdiction. One of the detectives pulled me aside and gave me your name and address. In the last few days of September 2009, a friend in Camden called me and offered me money to move a car from Brooklawn, New Jersey to Boston, Massachusetts. He told me he would pay me $5,000 cash plus 
I could have the plates. He asked if I knew anyone 27 or 29 that wanted to paper trip. So he gave me a social security card. I drove the car, a black four-door Pontiac Grand Prix, and drove to an auto body shop outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I took off the plates and with a black magic marker, wrote down the last five digits of the VIN number and cleared out the glove box. I came back to Camden a day later and he told me that the car was not stolen but missing. He said a friend of his, a cop in Camden, got into a fight with a girl. She died and he needed to get the car out of Jersey. About a month ago, my daughter was playing in the garage and found the box with the plates and social security card. I had forgotten all about it. The plates are DND 7772. The social security card, and this is where Sharpless's cell phone number was written in this spot and the last five digits of the VIN are the person wrote the last five digits of Sharpless's vehicle's identification number in this spot. Right. Now I think some of this stuff was actually reported or public knowledge but I think it's definitely that VIN number would be hard to get. The writer goes on to say because of Hurricane Sandy I had to visit Jersey to help friends clean up I decided to drop you this letter. What happened to Tony, I don't really know. All I know is that she had a run-in with the police, and I was paid much-needed cash to get the car to a shop in Boston. Again, the the letter is not signed. It's a one-page letter. And as you said, Captain, yes, the we do know that the plate number was readily available. This was not only... I mean, it was on the internet, plus it was on flyers looking for, for Tony because her vehicle was missing as well. The The difficult thing, as you said, are the five digits of the VIN number. And we could speculate day and night how difficult it could have been or how easy it could have been to get Tony's cell phone number. Mm-hmm. That may have been difficult. We do know that it was a relatively new phone. I don't know if that came with a new number. Um, but... We should point out the VIN number and the cell phone number were both correct. They were Tony's. Now, Elaine turned over the letter to the West Brandywine Police and also notified the New Jersey State Police and the New Jersey Attorney General's Office. She also gave the letter to the media in hopes that it would keep Tony's case alive. Later, she learned that police believed the letter to be a hoax, probably because it was sent in close proximity to the two hoax phone calls. She's not certain why they came to this conclusion, but that's what they have said publicly, that this letter is is a hoax. What are you feeling about this letter? Because you're you're Captain Letterman. We will cover every case that involves a strange letter. Yeah. So I have a lot of questions about this letter. I think that most of the information in, so this is not the same as like the Zodiac who, who kills Paul Stein and then provides you a bloody torn off piece of his shirt in a letter. This is very different. This is somebody who is claiming to have done something, been paid by somebody else, possibly limiting their involvement, limiting their involvement. And then my proof of you to believe my word is I'm going to provide you with these three things, these three pieces of information. And they could have obtained these in the exact manner that they said, that they took the plates, they wrote down the VIN number, they cleared out the glove box. They easily could have obtained all these things from that exact action. However, I believe that somebody could have got this information if they looked and spent a little bit of time on it. I don't mm. think it would have been extremely difficult to find all three of these things and provide it. One thing that I find interesting is that when, with the claim of having the social security card, this individual then provides her cell phone number in, in place of what, what he or she probably should have put the social security number. Right. So that makes me wonder... Well, why have a hoax? Why why write this letter? 
Well, those are things that point to me point to me that it could be a hoax, okay? Mm. Uh, before we move on, I do want to clear one thing up because some people might be asking themselves this uh, of some of the wording in the letter. When he says that he was asked if anyone, if I knew anyone 27 or 29 that wanted to paper trip, so he gave me a social security card. What they mean by this is somebody that wants to steal an identity, to to take somebody else's information. Oh, and, right, right. Yeah, that's the that's the paper trip that he's talking about, or she. Um, so here's where I have a, a different issue with it, where I question the validity of of the letter. Mm-hmm. I'm also a bit horrified and terrified by the letter. Mm -hmm. There's something very strange going on here. If there were to be three hoaxes and then we have the, the one of the police officers, the chief of police saying he believes just by listening with his own ears that, that the, the caller of those two calls were one, in fact, the same. So if those, if the two calls that come in that are hoax that try to put Tony and her vehicle in Toronto, and then the other call tries to put Tony's vehicle somewhere in South Dakota. And now this letter is stating that, Hey, I live in Philadelphia. Right. Um, somebody from Camden hired me to do this. Uh, I had to move the car from Brooklyn, New Brooklyn, New Jersey to Boston, Massachusetts. We have six different cities named in three different hoaxes. And then on top of that, if, it's not that big of a leap to go, okay, well, if the same person made those phone calls, did then the same person write this letter? And that's where I get horrified and terrified at the same time. There's there's something very strange there if one person is responsible for all of these communications. Yeah, but to me, it's like, what is the hoax trying to prove? It's trying to prove that she left the area that she was last seen by her friend. That's to me what these are trying to prove. So that draws it's like me it's back. trying to steer the direction of the investigation, like throwing them off the trail. If they were in fact, that's, that's the other problem I have with this whole thought. Right. It's four years later. The only conceivable reason that I can come up with that somebody would, would make these communications mm would be just that to throw them off the trail. But, but we're under the belief that the case had gone cold by this time. So there is no trail. What trail are they on? Were they even on a trail at the time? Right. But maybe I'm just saying if something happened bad at that party, that they're still, you know, they feel guilty. Um, they, they, uh, feel paranoid. Maybe they're they're creating this hoax for that reason. Let's keep you away from thinking about that party, unless you because they don't know the leads. But again, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you'd think unless the cops were constantly beating down their door and and asking for information, why would you involve yourself anymore? Why not just stay away? Right. And if you had nothing to do with it, why involve yourself at all? That's why I'm saying it's, it's all weird, man. It's all weird. And and then, then you, well, got- if, if you weren't involved, you, I don't think you would create the hoax I'm saying, but again, the, the other possibility that I haven't really thought about till now is the idea of when, when she says, Crystal said, well, she, I thought she would come back for me. And it's like, what if at some point, Tony did come back and she went back to the party without crystal. Mm. You know, this is not, you know, we're just basing it off of if the cops might believe crystal and she might be telling the truth about that, but that does not mean that Tony didn't go back to the party. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, if we haven't done any search of this property, I, I, I just don't know how, again, and we also don't know how many individuals, uh, were at that house. So is it there? Were, but I do know there was enough individuals that something bad could have happened and somebody could have disposed of her car. It would appear that something happened to this car. And actually 
Tony's car going to a chop shop out of state makes some sense why her car has never been located Yeah. after this point. I, I do want to throw this information out there, and I have names here, but I've I've purposely removed them because I question how how true this this information is uh-huh. uh this is um uh, but but it does cite several of the things in the letter that we just talked about so an estranged wife of an ex camden police officer okay remember in the letter the the letter writer claimed to have been paid by somebody that said that that tony had a run in with a police officer right so an estranged wife of an ex-Camden police officer who was fired after falsifying reports in order to get this estranged wife arrested, this wife comes forward, talks with the private investigator, Elaine, and tells her that her ex, who lived in Brooklyn, I keep wanting you to say Brooklyn, it's Brooklawn, New Jersey. Right. Again, the town mentioned in the letter also ran an auto business where he would repo cars and resell them, including the area of Boston. She claims that at one point she saw a black four-door Pontiac with tinted windows in their driveway one day and assumed it to be one of these vehicles, one of his cars that he repossessed or that took possession of to resell. So again, that's information that was provided to us. Yeah. It's it's always difficult when you have these these marriages that go south, that go way bad. They to, all they all go south. It, it's tough to it's, whether or not you get a divorce, that's a different thing, but they all go south. It seems like he was definitely up to no good because we do have the Camden Police Department who claims he was fired for falsifying reports yeah you're a liar right i mean that's and i want to believe the letter it seems like it makes sense it seems like just with the vin number it's not the full vin number right it's just part of the vin number five numbers the last five but it's enough for me to go okay that's information that's not easy to get my issue with it is if you're going to come forward with this letter, why not just come forward all together? Because you see what I mean? Like, I feel like by sending this letter, whoever paid you could come after you, could come after you. And if you don't go and tell them your full story, then you've offered yourself no protection from that person. Right. It's not like, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, well, they, but they didn't put their identification in the letter. Well, no, but. No, but the person that, but the person if it's that, real, the person that paid this person. Right. Like, he well, knows where you are. A, a, according to the letter, it was like a person, that he there was a middleman, right? So. Right. So the police officer, if in fact the letter's correct, may not exactly know who ultimately was paid to move the vehicle, who ultimately wrote the letter. Right. But it it's but come it forward. won't be that hard for him to figure it out, right? Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't be that hard for no. him to figure that out. So I are you ready for another twist here, Captain? Sure. All right. On May 15th, 2014, Tony's mother Donna received a check in the mail from the Department of Revenue, state of Indiana, for just, it was a little over $1,000, this check. Mm. This was a tax refund check. What's notable is that the check was made payable to Tony Lee Sharpless and Robert E. Morales, husband and wife. This Tony and Robert apparently filed joint state returns on earnings of $46,625 from Johns Hopkins University. Tony's occupation was listed as a nurse and Roberts as a doctor. A bogus phone number was on the return. Now, this is mind-boggling. 
for many reasons, but mainly because a man named Robert E. Morales went missing from Phoenix, Arizona, two weeks before Tony did, on August 8th, 2009. He is still missing to this day. You can see his Charlie Project page on their website. I wonder if somebody is trying to scam the system and going, hey, let's put these two missing people together, you know, but how would you file a tax return? So the the private investigator, Elaine, contacted the Department of Revenue in Indiana, and she said that she learned it was a legitimate refund check and that the tax returns in Tony and Robert's joint names had been filed electronically. As for why the check was sent to Tony's old address instead of the address listed on the return. Elaine said she was told that whenever the address is less than one year old, that they just send it to the former address. Who knows how this happened, but significantly someone had stolen Tony's identity and yeah, but that could have nothing to do with her disappearance. It could have nothing to do with the case, but then you also wonder if in fact that person had access to her social security card and Mm-hmm. We know that the anonymous letter writer mentioned that he had the card. Uh, Donna, her mother, believes that Tony kept her social security card in her wallet, which, of course, has never been found. But this is what drives me just absolutely insane about these missing person cases. The investigation should have been harder on these people at the party. They should have investigated that property, period. Did the cops know, did law enforcement know that she'd be going missing for the rest of her life that would be sitting here 10 years later wondering where she's at? Mm-hmm. No. But you got to start by assuming that. Mm-hmm. You need to assume that the worst case scenario is going to happen and you need to make sure that you do your due diligence. Don't be a piece of shit, right? Well, it, it, here's it, here's the thing. I, I see two things kind of going on here. There are points in this investigation where me on the outside looking in, it appears to me that they are doing their due diligence, that they are working the case hard. But there are other times where I have a completely different feeling. And this is not a small case. This is an investigation that's been 10 years now. How many, how long and good have they worked on it through the course of that time is certainly up for for debate. And, and my own opinion is at times it was not good on their end. That could be that we have multiple jurisdictions involved in this. I will say that the local police investigating the case gave the impression pretty early on in what I would consider to be a very unprofessional manner that, that they believed Tony was simply on drugs and or crazy. So when you have that coming out of their department, you really have to wonder, and I'm sure a lot of people close to Tony are wondering the same thing, is, in fact, if they were investigating the case thoroughly, if they were giving her disappearance the appropriate uh, due diligence, as you were saying. Well, it's pathetic that they would call her crazy because, look, if you break your arm, what do you do? You go to a doctor. Got something broken in your brain, you go get help for that. So that, to me, that's uh, a sign of somebody trying to get help. I, I I think my gut is telling me that this there's more truth to this letter than not, and and I couldn't tell you why, but it's like, <sighs> you, yeah, I'm not ready to dismiss it as quickly as what it appears law enforcement has. Yeah, the VIN number, I can't get over that, and then also, uh. I don't know how much I buy the, the the ex-wife of the cop coming forward and saying, hey, I saw a car similar to this. I don't know, but um, but those are two things that line up, mm-hmm. and, and that needs to be followed. Um, and it's sad because, like you said, this car probably went to a chop shop, and there was probably evidence of, uh, uh, there's probably evidence of what happened to her. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's gone forever. And I, I, you know, I, I do know that some I feel of bad for her daughter. 
I do know that some of Tony's friends absolutely believe that Tony never left Willie Green's house that night, that something happened to her there, and it could be any number of things. An overdose died in an accident, was killed as the result of some kind of physical altercation. There was a pool there. Maybe maybe she drowned in the pool. Uh, but, you know, their belief is that in order to protect Willie Green's NBA salary and reputation, that she and her car were later disposed of. And that's and we don't have the whole story there. Well, like Forrest Gump said, maybe it's both happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility that something happens at this party? They know a shady cop. They call the shady cop. Hey, we need your help, right? Or they call their lawyer. Their lawyer knows a shady cop. The shop, the cop comes the cop then knows some bad people that can help take care of this problem. It could be both happening at the same time. Is anybody there that night in some shape or form a police the, officer? Uh, right. And even from another city? We Again, we don't have the full list of names. We actually had two people that were unnamed in our list, and we're going off and saying that that is an accurate list of people. There could be additional people that were there that were conveniently left off of the list provided to law enforcement. My only issue with all that is, like I said, she would have had to drop her friend off and somehow circle back around because I do think that her friend uh, started out um, being a champion for finding her friend. And so that's the part that doesn't line up and, and unless, Possibly. Unless, unless she drops her off and circles back around, but you'd have to obviously. It would not be that hard to fabricate and manufacture the story of of Tony leaving, ditching her friend, and her phone conveniently being off all at the same time. Right. And, and to work that into her story. But to be the one to come forward and, and ask for a polygraph test, again, I, I we don't know what questions were on that test. We hear from law enforcement that she passed, but we don't know what questions. Um, and it's just a sad scenario for for whatever reason. Once you put mental health in it, it's. I think people. Uh, I think people are a little too dismissive of of things. Regarding the private investigator Elaine Law, she is no longer so certain that Tony is still alive. She does still believe that Tony was that something happened to her, and she was trafficked she does believe that the sightings of tony in the area were legitimate mm -hmm. she does continue to follow up on leads and tips to this day speaking uh, th there are there is some movement on this case as far as the private investigator is concerned there are still some leads that she is working on it would be it wouldn't be appropriate to discuss those here today because it's not something that we have a lot of of information on. Uh, but regarding Tony's parents, uh, her mother and her stepfather, they say they don't know what to think. Quote, it's like a roller coaster of emotion, Donna told one reporter. They aren't sure that Crystal is telling the truth, and they say that they have had no contact with her, but they also know that Tony should not have been drinking and could have been disoriented and gotten lost and ended up in the river or elsewhere. Right. Both of them feel strongly that it's a, that a search of Willie Green's home should have been conducted. When asked if she believes that her, if her daughter is still alive, Donna says, honestly, no, Tony would have called by now. She always did. No. My granddaughter is the same way. If she doesn't call me, I know something is wrong. No one knows a child like a mother. Tony's stepfather agrees with his wife, and he has also stated that someone must know what occurred the night of August 23, 2009. And he adds that she didn't just vanish into thin air, that there must be more to this story. Now, Tony is still listed as a missing person. The 10th anniversary of her disappearance is next week. We will have a photo of Tony on the blog at truecrimegarage.com. Tony's DNA has been entered into a national database. So if 
at some point a body is found, she will be identified. Hats go off to her, her friends and family and, and then her parents, you know, now looking after her, her child. And, and, and then also what an awesome individual to take on their case, the private investigator taking on their case for a dollar and uh, trying to make a difference in this world. That's pretty amazing. How about a little recommended listening for everybody this week? This week, I want to recommend the Stitcher app. You've heard it before. It's free. It's amazing. It has all of our old episodes on there to listen to. And you can check out our other show, our wonderful show that everybody loves, Off the Record, It's available on Stitcher Premium. I bring up the recommended listening, Captain, because this last weekend we were at the Ohio History Center and a lot of you came out and joined us there and we did a discussion on Ohio cold cases, which we've covered so many of them. Check those out on the Stitcher app. We will see all of you back here in the garage next week. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Hey, it's Danny with Butler Tires and Wheels. When it comes time to upgrade the wheels and tires on your car, truck, or SUV, don't trust just anyone. Trust the experts who know how performance wheels and tires best. Butler Tire. From Jeeps to trucks, Mustangs to Maseratis, Butler stocks the latest and largest inventory of custom wheels and tires built specifically for your vehicle that in most cases can be installed the same day. For superior service and quality products expertly installed, visit one of our four Atlanta locations today. Butler Tire. We baby your car.